Hello, listener. This is Max from Poor Historians. I wanted to break in and give you a little bit of an introduction to this show because it is not our typical. On this very special episode, we were happy to welcome our first ever guest. And though we had covered the subject material of the book in its own episode, this interview was so comprehensive that we felt it stood on its own. So with that, I invite you to listen in to a very special episode of Poor Historians, our interview with a very special and distinguished guest. We'll be back to our usual nonsense next show. This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to provide medical advice. It exists only to entertain. Cases through our history. It's just Max and there and Mike and me. You gotta listen, you don't have to read. For historians, for historians, for historians. Welcome, everyone. This is Poor Historians, a podcast delving into the archives of medical history. As three emergency physicians, we will explore the unusual ailments, treatments, physicians, and all related material having to do with the healing arts. I'm Max, and I'm joined here by my good friends and colleagues, Aaron and Mike. Gentlemen, something seemed different. Does it seem different? Yeah, it does. I don't like it. (laughs) (laughs) We are not alone. (laughs) Change is not good. There is somebody else in the studio today. What? <laughs> are they behind me? Tell me they're not behind me. Is this where we get a jump scare? Yeah, exactly. So today we are happy to be here with our very special guest. Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris has joined us on this special episode, fresh off the release of her new book, The Facemaker. This is the historical tale of Dr. Harold Gillis, the pioneering World War I surgeon who revolutionized the practice of plastic surgery in a quest to repair the devastating facial injuries caused by that conflict. Dr. Fitzharris received her PhD from Oxford University in the history of science and medicine. She is also the best-selling medical history author behind The Butchering Art, the story of the famous surgeon Dr. Joseph Lister, which we just covered in the last episode. That book was selected as both a best book by NPR as well as a New York Times editor's choice. She is also a contributor to The Lancet, Scientific American, and The Wall Street Journal, among other publications. And she is joining us here today from across the pond in England. Lindsay, so very nice to have you here. Thank you so much for that introduction. Also, I have contributed to Penthouse. I wrote an article. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to bring the mood way down now. (laughs) No, no, no. No, no. Is that still a thing? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I I contributed an article once on the history of sex devices um, and and syphilis and gonorrhea and all of that fun stuff. So I'm sure I ruined people who bought that issue. I ruined their day (laughs) when they stumbled upon that article. If they read the article. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. (laughs) Now, Lindsay, we like to think we have a very highbrow audience, but um, (laughs) we're we're willing to accept uh, new members and listeners, so uh, we appreciate that. They're they're all be coming to this podcast now. (laughs) That's right. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, we we're we're here basically to talk about your new book, The Face Maker, which came out just uh, just about a week ago on June seventh. And so, as I mentioned in the introduction, this is a book basically about the revolutionizing of plastic surgery during World War I. And the biggest, most important first question I have to ask you, are we pronouncing Dr. Harold Gillis correctly? It's Gillies. Yes. (laughs) Oh, really? Oh, because I said, I said, I said, hello. Was there a (laughs) bad? (laughs) Hello. (laughs) That's very fancy. (laughs) Soft G. We, we had a whole, there was a whole debate and argument during the recording of the episode that uh, who was pronouncing it correctly. So we had to, we had to take a uh, uh, educated guess. Well, some of your, your listeners might know the very famous actor, Daniel Gillies, who is in the Vampire Diaries, and he's been in a lot of TV shows. Anyway, he's the great, mm. great nephew of Harold Gillies, who my book is about, and he's actually narrating the audiobook. Oh, wow. Oh, I was going to cool. mention cool. that. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And uh, in, well, that's really cool to have that connection. Right? Yeah. And I just tweeted at him about. as a joke. And he he was like, yeah, let's do it. Because with the butchering art, um, I had to go through several different voices. They, they send you like voice examples, actors for that one. And um, I said, well, I feel like it needs to be a male voice. And they sent me this guy named 
Ralph Lister. And I was like, well, wait a second. Is he related <laughs> to, to Joseph Lister? And they're like, yeah, he's related. So I said, well, I don't even care what he you know, sounds like. I want him to narrate. So Ralph Lister does the butchering art. And then I joked on Twitter oh. that I needed to find a connection to Gillies. And Daniel Gillies stepped in. That. So that's been really fun. Is that going to be your process from here on out? I Just guess find, it find is. <laughs> I guess it is. Actually, my third book, which has been announced now, is going to be on Joseph Bell, who was a surgeon in the 19th century, and he's the real-life inspiration for Sherlock Holmes. He was oh, cool. uh, Conan Doyle's oh. teacher, and so it's going to be a romp through Victorian forensics and stuff. So I'm going to have to find a Bell mem- member of the family to kind of narrate that audiobook as well. well I was going to say, as you get further back, it's going to be a little bit more difficult, yeah. but <laughs> I think it can be done, right? We have uh, Ancestry.com. You can oh, just kind of say that nowadays. Check online. Exactly. Wait, is that Bell from Bell's Palsy? That is actually, that was his grandfather, Charles Bell, well, that's, named Bell's Palsy. Okay. So. That's one of my favorite diagnoses. Well, there you go. <laughs> That's a very random fact. Because <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 when we read, when we're reading through all these, you know, books and articles and everything, it's fun for us because we learn all this. Mm. We learn all these conditions, and you rec- you start recognizing names. And so, right, as yeah. for instance, when we're reading the butchering yard, I'm seeing all these names dropped, like Paget and. Um, yep. Um, oh, who was the other one that we, we mentioned? Yeah, oh, Hodg- Hodgkins. Yeah. Yeah. He's roomies with Hodgkin. You know, I mean, just stuff that it's really funny to us who, you know, it's so learn funny. All these names. Yeah. And these medical communities were so small at that time. And, and actually, you know, it, with Harold Gillies, there's a lot of plastic surgeons who feel a real genealogy. You know, like he's like the grandfather of of their discipline. And so it's not that many generations removed. You know, there's there's people who remember someone who actually worked with Gillies. Like you get those kinds of examples in these conversations, which is absolutely amazing to me as a medical historian. Oh, I can imagine. Well, you know, actually, to that point, um, kind of how did how did you get interested in uh, the field of medical history? Uh, our listeners would probably want to know. <laughs> I'm, I'm a super weird person, as you can imagine. I was, I was always a weird child. <laughs> I used to drag my grandmother from cemetery to cemetery hunting ghosts. And I think that people always thought I was a little bit obsessed with death and the macabre. But actually, I was just interested in the past and the people who lived there. And I always say that even if you don't like history, you might like medical history because everybody knows what it's like to be sick. And that's very relatable. So where I come in is I tell you what would happen in 1792 if you had a toothache or what would happen in 1844 if you had to have your leg removed. So I hope that even people who kind of shy away from history can pick up my books and enjoy them nonetheless. Because it is kind of terrifying to read. You think like (laughs) these things that are so easy to treat now. Yeah. I picture myself back then and it's terrifying. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely not romanticizing the past. I lean heavily mm. into the gore and into the violence and, and especially with the face maker, because I want people to know exactly what that was like to to be injured on the battlefield. You know, what was it like to lay on a battlefield for three days without a jaw, unable to scream for help? And I tell that I, and I'm able to tell that story because there were so many diaries and letters of these patients at the time. And they write so beautifully about their experiences. So that's been really helpful going into the 20th century as opposed to the 19th with the butchering art where, you know, a lot of times the people who end up in these Victorian hospitals are poor, they're illiterate, they don't leave behind a written record. So we really only get that story through the doctor's eyes, whereas with this book, you can get a, a, with a face maker, you get much more of a sense of the patient experience. Oh, definitely. And, and one of the other interesting things is I think you contrast when you have some of these scenes, especially in like face maker where it's uh, World War One heavy, and it, there are times when you are basically bringing the reader into the trenches and yeah. uh, and, and, and and painting a very vivid picture of that as dark and gory and uh, hellacious as that experience is. It's interesting that both in the face maker and the butchering art, the two main topics, Lister and Gillis, they are you're, you're very humanitarian um, yes. for surgeons, which I say. I, I don't I, I don't mean that to sound disparaging. It's just you, you have a picture sometimes of these heads and, and, yes, and famous yeah. people in surgery. And you have these amazing little intros into kind of the people that they were and yeah. how devastated they would be at the loss of a patient or how they would, especially um, Gillies, in his ability to um, form bonds with his patients and make them feel comfortable in the circumstances 
that they were in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Gillies is a really interesting character because he's quite a jokester. He has a very light sense of humor. Lister was a Quaker. He was very serious, which served him well because he, I mean, basically what he does with germ theory and antisepsis is he almost turns it into a religion. So you have these surgeons coming in in this processional and they're spraying the carbolic acid and he's able to change <laughs> minds through this kind of solemn activity. You know, whereas surgeons earlier than Lister, they're coming in, they're chopping off legs really fast. It's There's a lot of showmanship. So Lister is very much in contrast to that kind of era where there was a lot of showmanship. And then with Gillies, you know, his sense of humor really served him well, I think, um, getting through the horrors of the war. I always say that this was a time when losing a limb made you a hero, but losing your face made you a monster to a society that was largely intolerant of facial differences. These men were incredibly isolated. You know, when they left the hospital, they would have to sit on brightly painted blue benches so the public knew not to look at them. So <sighs> it was it was difficult. And I think Gillies being so open and so warm hearted was really helped them. And he bonded with his patients in a way mm -hmm. that, you know, a trauma surgeon near the front wouldn't be able to do because, of course, you're patching these men up and you're sending them back to the front or you're sending them back to Britain. Right. Um, but Gillies, this, this reconstructive surgery would take months, sometimes even years. So he really formed relationships with these men. When it shows, because how many of them stuck in his life for so long? Yeah, there was there was Big Bob Seymour, who uh, he gets his nose blown off. in the I think it was the Battle of the Somme. And uh, he ends up being Gilly's uh, private secretary for, for the rest of his life. So, yeah, they were very loyal to him um, and and really, you know, devoted and, and loved Gilly's just as much as he loved them. So I want to go back just a little bit because you talked about the letters that you used as sources. And in your acknowledgments, you do talk about quite a few sort of research professionals and archivists and such. And um, I just was curious a little if you could say a little bit more about like what's your favorite kind of historical source. And to you, what what's it like to use these original sources and documents when so much of what we look at because we don't research as as well, probably is <laughs> it's different in the internet. It's different, age. yeah, How, of course, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the the thing is too with the face maker. I was so out of my comfort zone. My, my publisher, uh, someone at my publisher, uh, joked that the book you never wanted to write is about to come out, and I'm I'm just filled with <laughs> dread here. So, although I'm a historian, I call myself a storyteller these days. I always go where the story is, and I didn't know anything about Gillies except that he had done this facial reconstruction. And I knew that storyteller instinct knew that there was a really good harrowing tale to tell there. And that's what I set out to do. But I didn't know anything about the First World War. I mean, I was literally starting out with, why did this war even happen? And by the way, it's it's very dumb, <laughs> as you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and it's easy to say 100 years from then. Yeah, you know? I mean, like... <laughs> and it made sense. It, no, it's still, even back then, probably seemed pretty dumb. <laughs> even back then, I mean, you know, and here's the other thing people people might know you know that the archduke ferdinand was assassinated but here's the crazy thing about it um the the assassins were set up on the parade route and one of them threw a grenade and the grenade was was either bounced off um the archduke's car or he batted it off it's unclear right it exploded <laughs> behind him he, he survives they they go off and then later he decides he's going to go visit the victims of the bombing at the hospital. They take him back on the same route. They're not supposed to do that. Somebody didn't get the memo. They take him back on the same route. Somebody in the car goes, wait a second, we're going the wrong way. The driver <laughs> reverses, the car stalls and happens to stop right in front of one of the assassins who's still hanging out on the streets. He takes the shot and that is the beginning of World War I, essentially. And the, and the guy who ends up killing him actually has uh, consumption tuberculosis, so so he feels like he has nothing to lose. And I think he he dies like a day or a couple days before the end of the First World War, which is also very ironic because his actions really set all of this. So it, I, it's kind of like if JFK, if they if Oswald had taken a shot, missed, and then they brought him back on the same route and they got <laughs> right. him the second time around. It's, it's one oh. of those weird things where you think, wow, were we fated to kind of enter this conflict? Um, but I was really starting at the beginning and the book isn't, uh, you know, it's not an extensive history of World War One. It's not a definitive history of, of war medicine at this time. It's a story. And it's a, it's a very particular story about this man, Harold Gillies and his patients. Um, but I set out to, to tell that because I thought it was really important because again, these men, like I said, they were, they were hidden from the public and I really wanted to give them back their voice and their stories. And I hope that people will feel that I had done them justice in the end. 
But to get back to the original question about the sources, yeah, it was it, it, there were a lot of challenges that I hadn't foreseen as a as a medical historian, which I should have. So, for instance, in a lot of cases, I had to prove these men were dead to get their records. I mean, could you imagine oh, if I had found wow. out like what I if know, it was? Yeah, yeah, that would have been the story. Like, oh, he's 140 years old and he's still. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I had to, I had to bring their, you know, I had to have to present their death certificates. The other thing is that there's still patient confidentiality around a lot of their records over here in the okay, UK. Yeah. Um, so in some cases, uh, Harold Gillies actually published their cases so that we know their names and the details. But if I had gone back into the case notes and found something that he hadn't included in the public record, I couldn't use that detail in relation to their name. Oh, so it was wow. very okay. complicated. Uh-huh. Whereas with the Lister story, it was in the 19th century. It was all kind of fair game. Um, and, and you didn't have to kind of navigate that really complicated world. So it was challenging. Yeah, I don't think they had discovered privacy back then. No, I, I know. I mean, <laughs> to some extent, not not in World War One too, but all that stuff gets locked down later. And and um, you know, I had I had various consultants at the end because this was again so far out of my comfort zone. I just wanted to make sure there weren't people like harumphing around a table, going, "Well, I think you'll find there's four buttons on the cuffs of the officer's uniform." You know, right. <laughs> and, and there was a there was a great war historian named Tim Cook who. Um, read my my early uh, versions of the manuscript. And for instance, this is how deep it went. So in the prologue, I have a soldier named Percy Clare who gets hit in the face. And I, again, wanted oh, to drop yes. the reader right mm-hmm. into that story. Well, I had said that he had risen to his feet and then fixed his bayonet to his gun. And Tim was like, no, no, no. He would fix his bayonet before he got to his feet. So sure. those little details, I just wanted to make sure I was getting right because I'm not a military historian. So I, I wanted to include other people's feedback. And I also got a disability activist involved to kind of talk about the language around disfigurement at the time. Oh, I think that's uh, those details are things that a lot of people may not think about. So it's really cool to hear the time behind the scenes, not only finding the material, but then making sure that it is delivered accurately because we have all watched many medical shows on TV and <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I was oh cringing gosh. at yeah, you I know. a lot I mean, of feedback while we're watching. You know, it's like it's Hollywood. Like, I'd love to get, for instance, the butchering art turned into a movie and I've written the script and I filmed a trailer. I don't know if you guys ever saw my trailer that no. I filmed. Oh, I got to send it to you. I've had four yeah, people please. faint watching it. <laughs> yes. All Perfect. men, I'm not making any comment beyond that, but it's always men who seem to faint. Now, my my friend Alex Anstey, who's a brilliant movie editor and director, he he put this together and it just kind of got out of hand. We were like, how far can we take this thing? So we did this 10, I think it's like six minute trailer. Um, and it was filmed in the old operating theater in London, which is the second oldest in the world. We don't oh, yeah. actually show much, but people's mind fills yeah. in the blanks. So we have a scene, for instance, where Lister, a young Lister, is watching a leg be removed without anesthesia. And at one point, the surgeon drops his knife or his saw and Lister bends down to get it. And you see the blood coming off the table, but you don't see the leg being cut into, but I think people right, right. just fill in that space, you know? And I think that, you know, that it's, it's unbelievable to us to think about, you know, being on an operating table without anesthesia. And when we were interviewing or auditioning, I should say actors for the roles, uh, we wanted to get like the biggest, strongest muscular guy to be on that table because we just thought like, that is moving a huge leg like that would take so much strength. And so we, we filmed this trailer, but you know, you have to take, you have to take leeway with the truth a bit um, because it's just so hard sometimes when you're filming something to make it absolutely accurate. So I'm one of those rare historians where I'm like, yeah, like let's make it look pretty and understandable to the audience. So I'm not one of those people who just goes into the movie theater and is like, I think you'll find. And I lecture everybody <laughs> <laughs> of course. about it. <laughs> well, some of those stories too, like, like the opening of um, uh, The Butchering Art, where it is the story of, isn't it? It's Lister, uh, Liston yep. Yep. amputating and Lister happens to be in the audience. Yeah. But that story, I mean, you don't have to dress it up much if it's if it's, as <laughs> it's, ac- already it's pretty just dramatic. generally yeah. accurate. It's a horror scene. It is a horror scene. It, it, in, actually, the modern, in the modern lens. Yeah, it's funny because when I decided I, well, first of all, when I was thinking about what book to write, I came across that scene and that was it for me. I was like, this is, is as you say, it's a movie scene because you have Robert Liston performing the first ever operation under anesthesia 
under Ether in 1846, and you have a 17-year-old Joseph Lister in the audience. And a lot of people thought that once anesthesia was introduced into surgery, everything was fixed. But that wasn't true. Actually, <laughs> surgery became much more dangerous because the surgeon was willing to pick up the knife and go deeper into the body. Sure. So to me, I was like, this is a movie scene. And um, I I have a friend named Ted Raimi. Talk about like the king of horror. He's been in a lot of horror movies. His brother, Sam Raimi, is a director. I was about to say. Yeah. Like, yeah. That sounds like a famous We just Raimi. watched <laughs> a Sam Raimi movie last yeah. night. It's, oh, right. There's okay. a new one out, mm -hmm. right? Is there? Yeah. Well, he, so I said to him, I said, well, I'd like to make this story into a movie. And he's like, well, come out to LA and I'll, I'll talk to you about it. And he taught me that we're watching the same movie. Basically every movie we see is like the same movie. And the first 10 minutes, this happens and the next 20 minutes, this happens. And then, you mm -hmm. know, so it's very formulaic. So I always joke that if Lister's story gets made into a movie, which I hope it does because it's an epic story, that it's going to look like everything happened in a really condensed timeline because of course you don't you can't age him up or down too much and all these kinds of things but of actually it the the process took you know decades before people really accepted germ theory and the transformation happened do you think you, oh i was just wondering if it would have an nc17 rating if you had the teratoma <laughs> scene in there <laughs> or, no, or, the, or the, the testicle on yeah exactly or the <laughs> sailor's penis like falling off that was also it's funny because when i would go around and do my book tour and, and and talk like i have to read my audience and i did have people faint during my talks and stuff and i thought i'd have to think like on my feet and go okay the sailor's penis story let's take that out you know let's skip that slide or whatever <laughs> so you generally got, if you have a sailor there's penis story you do need to know your audience <laughs> yeah you uh, very much so in advance <laughs> and it's funny too because uh, americans are are much more like open to it and they laugh and they kind of get in into the kind of fun of victorian surgery but in britain you don't get that kind of feedback necessarily and so hmm. also a lot of it's built around book festivals so it's like random people who don't know you or your book just coming in and a lot of them are like retired people and you just think oh god the sailor's penis is it's just not it's not for that audience so i'd have to really really think on my feet and kind of edit as I went. Um, but it was good fun. And I, and I always say, I'm not here to romanticize the past. I'm here to kind of tell everybody the truth about what that was like to live in the past. And to appreciate where we are now in many respects, uh, when it comes to medicine and science, that is, yeah, absolutely. that is for sure a theme through our show as we pick up these topics and you're, we're reading about stuff. And a lot of these topics do end up being focused because a lot more history is written about the the Victorian era and those things. So those tend to be easy topics and figures to pick from. Um, and uh, it, uh, the overarching theme is I'm really glad for modern anesthesia, infection <laughs> yeah. control, pain medications, et cetera. Because... Oh my gosh. Today is the best day and tomorrow will be the best day, medically speaking. And, you know, in 10 years and 20 years, I think when we look back in a hundred years, we'll look at chemotherapy as one of those kind of brut brutal, barbaric things that gets replaced by something mm -hmm. that's less harsh on the body. But I always ask my audiences, you know, what do you think is going to be the thing that in a hundred years we go, I can't believe people used to do that. Yeah. It, we often say that. Yeah. There's so many. There's yeah. <laughs> it's a long list. <laughs> And we're kind of, when we're doing our show, we're also conscious. We're making fun of medicine a lot of times, hundred years ago, and we. I think every once in a while, we do nod to the fact that stuff that we do now is is yeah. going to be ridiculous. It's all going to be obsolete. Oh yeah, there's stuff we learned in residency that we was like, oh, I can't believe we did that. Yeah, as it, it, it's all going to be upsetting <laughs> at some point. We're gonna, you know, in a hundred years, historians will will look back and be like, you know, it's shocking audiences and people will be fainting and. You know, of course, when someone was uh, wheeled into the operating theater in 1855, they thought that this was the best thing that they had on offer. And of course it was. Um, sure. So, yeah, it will be interesting to see how things develop. Even I mean, medicine is changing so quickly, too. Even in the next five to 10 years, we're going to start looking back and going, I can't believe that, you know, we used to do this and that. Um, or even how you look at, you know, how the advice on treatment of COVID-19 has changed in just like oh, the yeah, past yeah. two years, which, in real which time. is really interesting because mm -hmm. people get like, they'll say, oh, that they were wrong the first time. But that's just the scientific process in playing out in real time in front of people. Um, Lister Definitely. also was criticized, you know, he would change his methods and he would get criticized by other doctors saying, well, look, he keeps telling, he told us one thing. Now he's telling us something different, but that was Lister. He was one of the first scientific doctors. He was changing his methods as he was getting more data and information. Definitely. Yeah. Which was unusual for the Victorian period. It, it's amazing to think of that as a weakness, you know, yeah, I know. And, and because it is so <laughs> important to adjust your, your thinking. And I think, 
modern medicine, when we have something new and revolutionary change our basic practice, I think there, I remember reading a study once, it takes about 10 years to filter down, even yes. in the modern era, until it becomes just obvious um, standard of practice. Yeah. Which and, is and still mind boggling. And the most uh, pushback often comes from within the medical community. You know, no, doctors yeah, themselves are, are very slow to change their ways. And as we see with Lister and, and even Harrow Gillies, you know, after the war, to kind of bring it back back to uh, my plug for my book here. <laughs> um, <laughs> but to, to go back to that story, you know, after the war, he had to convince people that plastic surgery, convince the medical community that plastic surgery was a subspecialty in its own right. And Definitely. in order to do that, he had to expand into cosmetic, not just reconstructive surgery. And so there were all kinds of interesting things that happened after. But it was a slow burn to, to get convince the medical community that this was there was something there, that there was a new subspecialty that was worth pursuing. Well, it was interesting, too, because you mentioned at one point in the book, you're talking about rhinoplasty. Mm -hmm. And I never would have thought of that as a very controversial cultural procedure. Yes. But yeah. it was controversial because a lot of people who ended up having it back then was to fix deformities from syphilis. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of the, the facial biases we even have today, like people say to me, we've, we've changed, we're more accepting, which there is an element of that. But you really just have to look to Hollywood to see this evil uh, this this lazy trope about evilness, right? So you have Darth Vader, you have Voldemort, you have Blofeld, you have the Joker, you have Harvey Two Face becomes evil yep. after he's disfigured. Like he's fine until he's disfigured. I mean, it's really awful. Like when I sat down to make this list, I was like, oh my gosh, there's so much. I mean, I watched the new Batman and um, sure. yep. Penguin yeah. is is disfigured. So it's it's really sad to see that, and we keep pivoting back to it because it's ingrained in us. Now people today they don't associate disfigurement with disease and criminality, but that is exactly the historical roots. So way, way back in the past, um, if you had syphilis, for instance, you would get something called saddle nose, your nose would cave into your face. Mm -hmm. um, I talk about in the butchering art, it was so prevalent in the 19th century that there were no nose clubs in London, like people would get together and share the fact that their noses had fallen off because they had syphilis. Um, <laughs> which you got you got to find the funny side of this terrible, you know, debilitating disease that's going to kill you. But the, but also certain criminal activities also uh, came with disfigurement. You would be purposely disfigured as a sign of your right. crime. And so all of that creates this facial bias, which is certainly alive on the eve of the First World War. And I would still argue is very much alive today, although people aren't quite aware of why that facial bias exists. Definitely. And, and and I think hopefully today, if I guess a positive would be, we might actually ask the question of ourselves, you know, what, as you are doing in, in, yeah. in, in the face maker, you know, we should stop and think about how we react to outward appearances. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, with Gillies, for instance, he banned mirrors on his wards and this was mm -hmm. done to protect the patient so they wouldn't get discouraged because sometimes as you get, go through the reconstructive process, your face gets worse before it gets better. But Gillies inadvertently instilled in these men a belief that they had faces that weren't worth looking at. So as mm -hmm. I said, it was a very isolating experience and Gillies is arguably a product of the facial bias of his society as well, because he is going way beyond restoring function. He's going beyond to restore the aesthetic so that the face is deemed socially acceptable. So these men are undergoing mm -hmm. surgeries that maybe medically aren't necessary, but societal wise, they are necessary. So Gillies himself is really much a product of that facial bias at this time as well. Yeah, you definitely speak to that, I think, in the book, talking about all the layers of what this meant to the, yeah. the soldiers and and I had a really, I had really interesting conversations with Ariel Henley, who's this disability activist. And, you know, we talked about the term disfigurement. Um, that might not be something that a lot of disability activists would use today. You would say facial difference, for instance. But we both discussed it and we felt that that was the right term because these men were, in fact, disfigured to the society that they lived in. And I did not want to lessen that experience for them. You know, when they went out, there's, there's a guy named uh, Private Walter Ashworth, and he's discharged. And when he goes back to work as a tailor's assistant, his boss makes him work at the back of the shop because he doesn't want him to frighten the customers. So this was really painful experience for a lot of these men. And I said that not all wounds were inflicted on the battlefield at this time. So I, I think calling it facial difference in uh, differences in 1917 isn't correct. I think disfigured is, although it's a harsh term and it, make, it might make us feel uncomfortable today, is probably the appropriate term for them at that time. 
and, and as you said through their experience there was is it corporal x yes i think you talked about that that's a gut oh that i know and i and i and i mirror it with with ashworth who i just mentioned but right Cor- yep. corporal x um we don't know his name. The story was told through one of Gilly's nurses. And what happened was he he came in, he was um, he had had a facial injury, he was fully bandaged, and he was joking the whole time that he needed these bandages to be taken off so that his fiance Molly could come visit him at the hospital. Um, and eventually the bandages were taken off and the nurse comes to see him and he's very depressed. And she realizes that a, a mirror had been smuggled in and he had caught a glimpse of his face. And mm. she said, well, why don't you have Molly come back in? And um, he said, no, that he would never see her again. And that he had written to her and told her that he had met a woman in France and uh, ended the the engagement because he didn't want her to be burdened or what he thought he would be a burden on her. Yep. So it was a terrible story. But then Ashworth, the, the man I was talking about who had to perform the menial task in the back of the shop, he has a similar experience where the fiance breaks off the engagement, but then the fiance's friend gets wind of this. She starts writing to him. They fall in love mm-hmm. and they end up getting married. So, you know, there was, there was happy story. There, there are happy stories in the face maker and there are some really tragic, horrible stories in it as well. Definitely, definitely. And, you know, one of those I wanted to ask you about, you the uh, you mentioned in the intro and then a whole chapter, um, I, I believe it was Private Percy Clare, correct? Yes, yeah, that's correct, um, yeah. Well, I mean, how did, he, how did he come to get his own chapter? Was it just the, <laughs> the, the story itself or you had more information or did something make you select to give him... Give him You're the first highlight. person actually to ask, like, why why Percy Clare? So the the book opens in the prologue for people who haven't read it yet with uh, Private Percy Clare getting hit in the face. And I really wanted people to understand how hard it was to get off the field. Um, mm-hmm. These stretcher bearers would often pass you by because the face is very vascular. It bleeds a lot. They didn't think that you could survive. They also sometimes put you on your back on the stretcher and you would end up drowning in your own blood or your tongue would slip back into your throat. So it was really mm-hmm. just a battle to get off the field. Now, the reason why I picked Percy Clare was that he wrote this incredible diary. It was so detailed. I mean, I could have just published it word for word. It was it was so beautifully written. Um, And he was one of few soldiers really that offered that level of detail from getting hit to getting sent to the wrong hospital later to all of those experiences. The only problem with Percy Clare. Well, there were a couple problems with Percy Clare. Number one, he gets hit in 1917. So the prologue opens in the thick of World War I. And Mm -hmm. then I have to dial the the clock back uh, in chapter one to right before the war so we can be introduced to Harold Gillies. So that was one problem. I don't think that was as big a challenge. The other thing was, and I won't give too much away, but he doesn't give the sort of Disney ending that one might want. And that at (laughs) first disappointed me. Um, But then I thought, you know what, this is, this was war and, and something that could be tied up in a neat bow. I don't think would actually do the story justice in the end. People need to know the realities, the truth of what that conflict was. So in the end, I was happy with that. Um, His, I think it's like great, great, great niece. She, her father found the diary in the garage and And so then I said, well, do you have any photos? And she said, oh, I have a photo album, but we had a flood like two months ago. So she sends me this album and it's in plastic. The photos are in plastic. And so I can't take them out because they're all meshed in there. So I actually had a wonderful uh, photo restorer named Jordan Lloyd, um, who also oh. colorizes photos, and he did an extraordinary job restoring them for me. Nice. But yeah, it, and, and here's the other issue with um, Percy Clare, his medical records that were at the hospital that Gillies would have, you know, taught his all of his medical records are gone. Because during World mm. War Two, the Royal College of Surgeons was bombed, and a lot of those records were lost. So I really oh. only have Percy Clare's side of the story. I don't have Gilly's notes on that case and all of that. So it was it was challenging as a historian, but he really was the right person because of the way he describes his experiences. That's why I chose him. Yeah, there was a painful little aside when you mentioned that so many records had been destroyed. You're like, no. <laughs> I know. And <laughs> also the irony, happened? too, right, that these men who were so harmed in World War I, then their records are dist- – <laughs> a lot of their records are destroyed. Not all of them, but a lot of the records were destroyed. Um, so it's it's like they couldn't escape uh, it even, even later. You know, their textual records were even destroyed. That seems to fit. Yeah. That, that definitely fits. 
I'm excited about this book. Like I said, there's photos for anybody who's listening. There are photos in the book. Um, it was a real kind of fight as well to include those photos. There was like, there was a debate about if they were too graphic, but I don't want to put these men on the blue bench in 2022. I, I think we need to look oh, at definitely. them. Um, but there were a lot of photos, you know, I did the sort of before middle and after for each panel. Um, and there was an exception as well. If, if, a, if a soldier died in Gilly's care, I felt that it wasn't appropriate to put his photos in. So there was Certainly. a pilot named right. um, Second Lieutenant Henry Ralph Lumley. I have a little cheat sheet here because I always want to get their ranks right. Um, and he crashed on graduation day, actually. And hmm. it takes a very long time for him. He's, he's terribly burned. It takes about a year to get into Gilly's care, at which point he's addicted to morphine. He begs Gilly's to do the operation as quick as possible. Gilly's really wants to put it off. He doesn't think that um, Lumley is strong enough to endure it, but he does it anyway. And he was hmm. right and Lumley dies. And it teaches Gilly's yeah. a really important lesson that you should never do today what you can reasonably put off tomorrow. And that also when you're reconstructing the face, you really should do it in small increments because the body can get overwhelmed. So his story is important to medical history, but personally tragic. And I felt that his photos shouldn't be included. So what I did is I included a pre-injury photo of him in his uniform, as well as a surgical diagram of what Gillies had planned mm, to do. Yeah, sure. Um, but these Makes men, sense. you know, there's people probably listening who know this game called Bioshock. Um, yep. I, th I think it came out like in 2018 or, or maybe even earlier, but they used Gilly's patience to construct, I've never played it. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, they used the, the, the actual photos. They based it off his patients. And so Lumley, oh, wow. the pilot is, um, one of the characters called the CRISPR. And I feel awful about this, but I'm open to a debate. Like some people have said, well, it got, it, it's the first time that I heard of Harold Gillies and it made me look into his story. But my feeling is these men didn't have a choice. They certainly couldn't have imagined that their images mm -hmm. would be used in this way. Um, and I realize that I'm obviously using their photos in my book, but I hope that in the end people will feel that it's it's valid there because I've given a lot of context and I've really thought about how those images are used. So in Lumley's case, he's not in there, um, but people will be familiar in pop culture with his image, you know, through this through That's this video game. No, it's clear you take a tremendous amount of time to give the appropriate respect to these these people and what happened to them. I mean, that comes through in your writing clear as well, day. Well, thank you. So. I mean, this the tone of this was was quite different, like very difficult as a writer. I like to challenge myself. You know, the the butchering art, Victorian surgery, you can kind of ham up. You know, it's like yeah, people were just sure. doing crazy <laughs> things in the operating theater, and there and there is this almost like comedic level. Although I hope that if people read the butchering art, they also get a sense of of the you know, severity and how terrible it would have been also to be a doctor and have to go in and take someone's leg off without anesthesia. Sure. I can't imagine the the stress of that. But there is a hamminess to sort of Victorian surgery, I think, that we all kind of delight in. And with this, there's nothing like that. And so there's been some early reviews of readers who get it on NetGalley. And one of them said, you know, I loved the butchering art. And I, I'm, I'm very voyeuristic when it comes to medical history. And I was right here for this. And then when I got into it, I realized it's too soon. And I yeah. felt that Fitzharris had done this very well. She leans into the violence, not because she wants to you know, describe the, the, for the voyeuristic aspect, but she wants people to understand what these men went through. So I felt really validated with that review, just because I hope that people will, you know, enjoy the butchering art, certainly, but also then be able to pick up the face maker as a completely different kind of book. Um, but hopefully just as entertaining, if we could use that word as well as educational. I think that's, I think it's ex exactly fair because the voice of the book is definitely a bit different from butchering art, but it is contemporary to the time. So when you're talking about World War One, I, I think it's important to describe the injuries. And then I had to appreciate the, uh, towards the end of the book where it's like, oh, by the way, people are coming down with a respiratory illness. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Gosh, so I was I like, oh, no. Believe. That's right. Uh oh, <laughs> yeah. Here it comes. I know <laughs> this was going Oh soon. my yeah, gosh. And we didn't, we didn't get soon. out of that very, very, you know, there was no vaccine. We, you know, mm -mm. a lot of people died. It had a similar mortality rate. I, I mean, I believe um, to COVID-19, I think it was like between one and 2%. People will say one and 2%, that's nothing. But when you extrapolate and you let that thing run mm -hmm. rampant, 
stamp mm-hmm. it. That's a lot of numbers. The other weird thing about the Spanish flu at this time, and, and I talk about in the book, it was called the Spanish flu, interestingly, because Spain wasn't partaking in World War I. And at that time, newspapers had like a lockdown on mm-hmm. bummer news, <laughs> you know, that would kind of <laughs> upset people. And so they weren't actually reporting these cases at first. And so the first cases that really get reported in the media are out of Spain. Spain's not participating in the war. And the King of Spain is one of the first victims to fall. So it, it gets this name, mm-hmm. the Spanish flu, but it probably didn't even originate in Spain. Um, but, you know, when the, the weird thing, or I shouldn't say the weird thing, but the thing about the Spanish flu that was different, certainly from COVID, was that it was hitting young people uh, mm-hmm. very hard. And so these yeah. men were coming out of the trenches. They're, they're, they were already depleted. Their health was depleted. And so a lot of people ended up dying. And you imagine, like, you survive World War I, and then you die of, of the flu. It just seems so unjust and so unfair but i guess that's how these viruses work or you survive uh, your facial injuries yeah and are sent back to the front well yeah, yeah. and that happened Ugh. a lot too there was one guy um who harold gillies had fixed up he gets sent back to the front he gets shot in the knee he ends up bleeding out in the same casualty clearing station that he had first been brought to mm-hmm. so you know, I tell people there was a lot of medical advances that came out of the First World War. You know, there was blood banking, there was intratracheal mm-hmm. anesthesia was developed. All these things are in the face maker. But as wonderful as these things were, they actually prolonged the war because as doctors got better at patching these men up, right. they were being sent right back to the front. It Ugh. was feeding the site. So I think it's really important to keep that in mind, especially as we're seeing the return of, you know, old fashioned warfare in Europe at the moment in Ukraine. And I live in the UK sure. right now. So that's all very real and very scary over here. And and we're literally seeing this kind of return of of a trench warfare. You know, people, re- they're, they're building trenches. And um, I can't help but think of the face maker when I see these scenes on the news. Yeah, it's it's hard to look back through this window. It was a modern war, but the the more recent wars in my memory that I grew up with were nothing like the scale of World War One. I. I mean, it's just... I have to read the numbers two or three times to be like, is that really? What it's crazy. She, uh, and they didn't know any, they didn't know anything about what they were getting into. There was a story I had come across of a, of a boy, really. I mean, he must have been about 15 or 16 when he went to enlist and they asked him, did he want to enlist for uh, the duration of the war or for two years? <laughs> Or for a year or something. And he was like, well, I don't want to stay in it for a year. I'll just stay for the duration of the war. And then, I mean, and there's also, I think Shackleton, um, Ernest Shackleton's, you know, famed expedition that they were, they were stuck in the Arctic for years. You remember that story? And um, I think it, it was like two years they were wandering around and, and they finally found civilization and they had survived this like horrific event. And then I think one of the first questions was, when did the war end? And they're like, the war yeah. is like, still yeah. going on. Yeah. <laughs> and some of those Oof. men who survived that went and fought and died then later oh in the gosh. trenches. I mean, imagine surviving two years in the Arctic and then dying in World War I. I mean, it's just, it's just mind boggling. You think of these generations that went through that World War I, the Great Depression, mm-hmm. World War II. I mean, it was just a constant hammering. There's not many people in the modern era, uh, I, especially not me, that would have any semblance of that understanding. Yeah. When my internet goes out, yeah. I, it's I like am the worst thing ever. ever. The, the worst end. thing yeah. ever, yeah. There, you could tell your rage levels kind of increase when your internet goes down. But it, but it is true. And that people think of like the 1920s as this fun time, but actually people were just drinking their misery away. I mean, most of them would have known people that they <laughs> lost in the war. I mean, it was it was a real, in, in, or during the p- pandemic, you know. So it was a real kind of numbing time in the 20s. Um, and I think that we look at it kind of romantically now, but I think there was probably a lot of psychological damage that the war and the pandemic had done to people going into the 20s so this is this is ending on a great joyful note yeah i was gonna say you managed <laughs> to get pretty dark but you, you you pull the reader through with these like by bringing it down to a personal level i don't think you ever feel overwhelmed by the tragedy of the age and then there's those mm. hopeful bits about like the christmas party that they had at, at yes, the hospital and yeah. such like little things where they're like yeah they were in the middle of this but and you know, and the epilogue is very funny through. because Gillies moves into cosmetic surgery, and there's these hilarious. I mean, I wish I could have wrote more about this, but you know, there's this scene where he fixes uh, this man's wife's um, nose, I, I, or or something on her face, and it doesn't go very well. And the man comes in with a gun and 
takes a shot at Gillies and and he and Gillies later thinks this is hilarious story. So he's always retelling the story about how he should wear a bulletproof vest. And, you know, it was very much a learning curve. And so when he moved into cosmetic surgery, there was a lot of kind of funny stories where his personality really shined through because again, he was he was quite the character. And there's other characters too, you know, people who liked the butchering art and loved Robert Liston, the, the fastest knife in the West End. Mm-hmm. I think my Robert Liston of the face maker is Charles Balladier, the French dentist who Sure. retrofitted his Rolls Royce with a dental chair and drove it to the front under a hail of bullets. This guy was a <laughs> bad ass and yeah. he worked for free the entire war. I mean, it, there were so many crazy stories because World War One, nobody nobody kind of knew what they were doing. It was like this modern warfare. And I mean, these pilots that go up into the air, this is 10 years mm-hmm. after the Wright brothers take to the, to the skies. They call themselves the 20 minute club, the amount of time it takes to shoot down one of their planes. <laughs> <laughs> they're taking pistols up in these planes. I mean, there's exactly. so, oh, yeah, so yeah, many. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're shooting at each other from uh, from yeah. the cockpit with pistols, which Post is crazy. Might. And they also they also <laughs> shot themselves if their planes were crashing. So, I mean, this was a crazy time, and people, you know, they were joining up. They didn't really know what was awaiting them, and and so I, I the, the the story is heavy. I'm not going to lie. I mean, it's called the face maker, but there is there are joyous moments, and there are definitely sort of moments where you're like, I can't believe people did that. I mean, really heroic moments where you think that person must have been absolutely insane. I don't have that kind of heroic bone in my body. Like I would not be running into these situations with my Rolls Royce to the, de- you know, to the front. Sure. Um, not that I have <laughs> yeah. a Rolls Royce, but Apparently if I did, or... I wouldn't, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be driving it to the front under a hail of bullets. So I, I really <laughs> kind of delighted in, in finding those, those people and telling their stories because I think that, it, you know, looking back in 2022, we, as you say, you think we have problems because our internet goes down. Um, but think about these guys going into this war. So. Well, and I think for us as ER docs, you know, and a lot of stuff that we see, we, we, especially through this podcast and we read these stories or many of times have atrocious dark mm-hmm. alleys in them, or that's mostly what they are. We have gallows humor for a good reason yeah. because <laughs> yeah. it, it, it is, uh, I, I think, uh, I, I think I would argue it is a, a healthy coping mechanism, but if you lean too far into the darkness of something, mm-hmm. you do miss some of those some of those bright highlights. Yeah, and... definitely. Well, you need someone like me to kind of document. Maybe I could follow you guys around and, and do like a year sort of <laughs> survey of the ER doctors. I mean, ER doctors are the Valadiers of 2022. You know, you guys are doing wild stuff. You see wild stuff. Like I can't even imagine what's coming through those doors. But um, but it, it, it is, uh, like I said, you know, don't, if people who are listening, don't be afraid. It's it's a heavy story, but there are moments of joy. And there are, there are even funny moments in it you know i definitely think that um there were some characters in there and even gillies he dresses up in an alternative persona and brings champagne in and he gambles with the guys yeah what was his name dr Dr. scroggy oh yeah (laughs) (laughs) and you don't know this but mike has an alter ego named dr provolone yeah he's an italian (laughs) doctor (laughs) he always complains about the stitches being too tight (laughs) (laughs) see there you are you got a little bit of a a gillies uh sense of humor in you but it's it helped i mean your patients remember that like that that helps you know make it less scary and he would always say um don't worry sonny you'll have as good a face as any of us when i'm Mm -hmm. done with you and i just think that even if that wasn't true in every case which we know it couldn't have possibly been true in every case um he he, there was a lot of comfort that came with that confidence that he he brought forward into into his practice so he did an incredible job and i i'll end by saying that if harold gillies is the backbone of the face maker then the disfigured soldiers are really its beating heart so this is a story Mm -hmm. not just about one man but about many men and i hope that's also reflected in the in the cover art um which you guys will have seen but it's Mm -hmm. a it's a picture or it's it's a illustration of a surgeon's hand holding a scalpel um, and in the reflection of the scalpel is a banded so, uh, soldier and it's based off Harold Gilley's own cover of his plastic surgery book which is mm. a photo oh, of really? his hands yeah. holding a scalpel and my husband is actually a caricaturist and a uh, cartoonist and so he came up with that concept and I was like this mm. this is a perfect Super kind of cool. yeah way to to convey that this is a story about one but also many men. So yeah, works on a lot of levels. Plus, mm-hmm. Gillies' uh, mention about the irrevocable first cut that you mentioned. That yes, the, I mean, 
that would have been scary. I mean, they didn't, he didn't know what he was doing yeah. either, you know, in a lot of cases. So, I mean, I hate to say that, but like, that was definitely true. I mean, this is before antibiotics, like there's so mm -hmm. many challenges he had to overcome and anesthesia, you know, um, it was very rudimentary. It was very similar to what you're seeing in the butchering art at this point. And so there is a scene where Gillies is leaning over his patient and yep. his patient mm -hmm. is breathing <laughs> ether back into his face and he's getting yeah. woozy. So at, it, <laughs> there's a parallel B story, which is um, the development of intratracheal anesthesia, which happens mm -hmm. uh, with one of Gillies' anesthetists. They call him anesthetist in the UK. Um, so that's part of the, the story of facial reconstruction, too. So thank God that also happened, right? Because otherwise we'd still be being held down with a nope. rag over our face, <laughs> which nobody needs. I mean, Stop that's resisting. still how Mike does his intubations. But, uh... <laughs> Stop resisting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, so, someone sleep. asked me uh, at, when I was on butchering t uh, the Butchering Art Tour, they said, is it true that um, surgeons would punch you out? And I was like, no. <laughs> I was like, imagine... <laughs> First of all, you'd have to be so good at that to, to make sure that that worked every time. But also, you'd be creating so many other issues potentially that you'd have to fix. Like, I was like, that wasn't happening. And also, it's kind of a myth that people were really drunk because that thins the blood. You wouldn't want your and also you wouldn't want your patient like fighting drunk on the table, uh, like fully awake. That wouldn't be good either. So, you know, it was really you were just um reliant on your surgeon being very fast. And um, if you go to the old operating theater in London ever, they have the original table that Liston actually operated on. Mm -hmm. And people, the first thing people say is it's really small. Like the, the Victorians must have been small, but actually it, um, it elongates. I mean, the Victorians were ingenious when it came to engineering these things. It was very uh, short. It seemed short to us, but you have to remember that if you're taking someone's leg off and they're not anesthetized, you want speed. So you don't want something that's really high up because you can't get the strength, right? So if it's lower down, sure. you can push into the cutting and you could Good take point. the leg off a lot faster. So these things tended to be lower to the ground, not because people were necessarily that much shorter, but because it facilitated the speed of removing the limb. So fun fact I for you. I am going to take notes on that for later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Never know. I always that's pump the bed up. I'm like, can you yeah. pump the bed up a little bit? <laughs> yeah. That, <hurt. laughs> that bed had to be low in the in those operating theaters. So yeah, anybody who travels to London, do check out that museum. It's fantastic. You do have to navigate a really scary staircase, but these operating theaters, if they still exist, they always were in the top of buildings so mm -hmm. that you had the attic light um, to come mm -hmm. in before electricity. So you do have to kind of navigate those those scary stairs to get up there but it's definitely worth the view in the end we got to do a uh, poor historian's uh, trip to uh england i think yeah, yeah. Really oh really my god there's so it. much yeah. stuff here yeah let me know there's a lot of gin and beer as well we'll, we'll have a good time it'll be great perfect. Yeah, <laughs> it will be great I, I think we should we should count on it and yeah. <laughs> uh we gotta go see um um lister's statue too oh one of, yeah one of two surgeons who have statues in england according to Something I there are, read. yeah, there's statues everywhere, it seems like, over here. I mean, also, there's statues for the World War One Memorial. I'm going to be on tour. I don't know when this podcast is going out, but I am going to be on tour. I'll be speaking at Penn Hospital. I'll be speaking in New York City. I'll be all over the East Coast, Harvard Bookstore, um, Politics and Prose in Washington, D.C. I'll be in L.A. and Chicago. Um, so people who are listening, check out on social media. You can come get a book signed, and I'll be giving a really short talk and uh, Q&As and things like that. Well, it sounds good. We'll look out for it, especially because Chicago would be a close stop. We can we can bring Great. our, our wrong, so, yeah. and, and get a signature. Yeah. International Surgical Museum. That's where I'll be speaking. OK. Oh, very so, cool. I know. Yeah. That. yeah. All right, well, guys. Thank you so much uh, once again for taking the time to join our show, Lindsay. We can't say enough nice things about your work. Thank you. Really, listeners, go get this book. Go read this book. Read The Butchering Art as well. They We we will overview them in our episodes, certainly, but we are leaving out so much because there is so much there. Um, and so uh, with uh, with that, uh, Lindsay, one last thing. Where is your book available? It's uh, not only hardcover, but I assume audio. And, it's, uh, yeah, any audio for, for Daniel. Daniel Gillies is narrating the audio. Um, and it's ebook as well. And there will be a paperback, but it comes out a year after hardback. So it's always worth getting the hardback, I think, because the cover is always like the butchering art. You guys probably just have the paperback, I'm guessing. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah the hardback is great because the uh, letters are raised on. It always has like a little bit more texture. So if you can get hardbacks, I always recommend it. Also, you can get signed hardbacks at Barnes & Noble. And they have... Um, specially printed designed plates um that my husband drew of a world war one soldier and i've signed them and so that's nice for like the first edition so you can check it out in barnes and noble for nice. signed uh signed copies and or you can come see me on book tour 
And a oh, super really important question. What was that issue of Penthouse you said? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was so long ago too. And actually my husband, who wasn't my husband at the time, he illustrated it. So he like drew all these like weird <laughs> objects and like, you know, the syphilitic nose and stuff. I really ruined people's days, but it was, it was good fun. And I was like, yes, Penthouse asked me to write an article and nobody reads the articles as we know. So. <laughs> uh, well, Mike's got an extensive collection archive. Of yeah, it's we'll probably in there. So we'll just go, we'll, we'll just, yeah, we'll have to, we'll to go <laughs> issue by issue be really tough for us yeah it, you'll have to do some archival research there <laughs> <laughs> that is research on our level so thank you so much Lindsay. really wish you all the best with the book and uh maybe we'll see you in the future yeah, on uh, tour definitely thank you guys It's it started with penthouse and <laughs> Which the, un, the story, unexpected but... the unexpected story, but <laughs> it's just funny because when people introduce me, I'm like, it's so serious. I have to I have to throw in something you know a little off the cuff, uh, depending on the audience. You guys are the sailor penis audience. I can tell. <laughs> yes, no, that's, so, that's it. You get a good read. Probably so. <laughs> so I, I got that right, but. Um,